thank you very much. And what an interesting conference this is uh, turning out to be, at least this morning, um, and a difficult act to follow. So uh, uh, first of all, some apologies. I'm, I'm an anthropologist. I'm going to be drawing on uh, ethnographic fieldwork um, here, not really rooted in a theoretical discussion. Uh, but if there is a, a theoretical issue in the, what I'm going to say, it's really about the production of silences and uh, the production of silences about particular forms and appreciations of land use uh, in uh, the humid uh, forests and uh, forest savanna transitions of western central Africa. Um, uh, secondly, I'm going to sp speak about dark earths or Amazonian dark earths, which is a, a bit of a cheek, given that some of the world specialists on those are here in the audience, uh, and I haven't even visited South America. So um, uh, if there's anything that I can uh, do, it's by way of sparking, I think, a conversation across uh, African and South American research on uh, anthropogenic dark earth, and, uh, and that's what I intend to do today, really, by way of developing a research agenda as much as uh, presenting uh, final um, conclusions. Right here on the left, uh, we've got uh, a picture of Amazonian dark mm -hmm. earth taken off the Terra Preta website uh, of Johannes Lehmann. Research on Amazonian soils, I think most of you would be aware of, has become fundamental to a total and radical reappraisal of the region's social and natural history. Patches of these dark, highly fertile soils that can support intensive farming are now being found throughout Amazonia undermining earlier interpretations that its infertile soils couldn't support settled uh, populous farming. These soil patches are known as Amazonian dark earth or terra preta and they are now found to be anthropogenic. Uh, the darkest terra preta, the black earth here on the left, are the middens of pre-Columbian settlements, uh, as it were the ruined settlement sites and more or less, I can't go into detail here. Others, called terra mulata, slightly lighter colored, uh, result from agricultural practices, it would appear, of pre-Columbian uh, farmers. Many are covered now in forest, but many more are appreciated by contemporary farmers as fertile soils. And pre-Columbian uh, populations are now understood to be far higher than earlier thought, uh, their decline far more precipitous, and their impact on modern Amazonian forests far more significant. Now, the significance of these soils extends beyond a reappraisal of Amazonian history. Firstly, modern farmers, as I say, value these uh, anthropogenic uh, antique soils. Secondly, agroecologists are researching ways to mimic their formation. Well, if we can produce these kinds of soils, or the, the uh, pre-Columbian uh, farmers could, couldn't it be achieved again um, in a way to enable more intensive land use in the region. And thirdly, because the secret uh, to these soils lies largely in their high proportion of charred carbon, um, they contain uh, or have the capacity to, to have a kind of win-win with carbon sequestration linked to climate change. So there's a lot of interest in Amazonian dark earths. But to date, uh, the, the interest has been confined to Amazonia, or at least Amazonia plus the neotropics moving up into uh, Costa Rica, El Salvador, and such. Uh, there's been uh, one paper, I think, by Paul Silito, indicating that research on Amazonian dark earths could be important to export these technologies to Africa. Uh, there's been some work on creating charred uh, black earths and mimicking uh, the, uh, the Amazonian ones in Kenya. But the question that I want to pose in this paper, really, is don't uh, dark earths already exist uh, in uh, uh, major parts of West Africa, uh, but perhaps unappreciated, just as they had been unappreciated in Amazonia until um, popularized by uh, researchers uh, in the last 30 years? So my argument really is that Amazonian dark earth research might not offer only new technology for transfer to Africa, but insights into existing African agricultural knowledge and practices uh, that might enhance research mimicking their formation uh, and make this kind of research that's now being conducted in Amazonia more applicable across uh, the world. 
it will help also, I think, understand uh, the nature uh, of African forests and people's relationships to it. The, the picture on the right is taken from Kisiduga, which is my fieldwork uh, site. What are, uh, uh, sorry, what are these dark earths? Well, they, the dark earths contrast very strongly with the, the soils in which uh, they, they are built up in. Uh, dark earths have about three times the amount of soil organic matter uh, of, of the substrate soils. Uh, they have about 70 times more uh, incompletely combusted uh, charcoal, uh, carbon within them. Uh, they're relatively stable uh, and resistant to microbial um, and the microbial degradation, uh, sorry, the humic part is, and they have other properties which I won't go into here. How are they formed? Well, it's a bit, they're a bit enigmatic, in fact. People are still researching how these Amazonian dark earths are formed. Um, practices, certainly they're not formed simply by shifting cultivation. Uh, practices enhancing the incorporation of biochar, um, rebalancing uh, through farming the, the kind of soil fauna that are found in uh, soils, perhaps uh, transforming the soil bacteria and flora, perhaps linked to forms of feedback uh, within uh, these enhanced systems. Again, I don't have the time to go into detail here. But can they be in Africa? It's, it's, it's a posing question. I suppose it's going to depend upon discussion about what dark earths actually are, what distinguishes a dark earth from another sort of darker earth, if you follow. But um, nevertheless, uh, I'm going to offer some preliminary evidence from Africa here. I'm going to question Amazonian exceptionalism, uh, uh, but I'm going to ask for more comparative research on this topic. One thing is certainly for sure is that the soils of West Africa and Central Africa and those of Amazonia are not so far distinct. We're talking about highly weathered altisoils, uh, feral soils, oxisols, um, and as you can see from this map, uh, in Trint, which is the FAO sort of basic map of soil types uh, and, and, and substrata, we're looking at uh, pretty much the same kind of uh, soil formation. Equally, the, uh, the rainfall, um, these, these soils in Amazonian conditions are found uh, throughout uh, much of Amazonia in, in many different um, uh, climatic uh, zones. And there's no reason to sus suspect that, uh, that the African conditions are, are any different. Well, I'm going to talk about Kisidugu, which I've talked about at great length for many years. So this is where, where um, I've conducted my research. And the landscape of Kisidugu is in the forest savanna transition zone of West Africa, where we have islands of forest um, in otherwise uh, grassy savannas. Here is a sort of 1950 uh, air photograph. You can see a kind of dark patch there. Uh, here's a slightly focused in photograph. Uh, you can see a village with all those village dots uh, being the houses uh, in the middle of a forest patch. Um, there with the savannah uh, outside, and you can see the paths leading in and out of the village. Again, a nice 1950s shot. Okay, but this landscape um, uh, is uh, not just characterized by the sites of existing villages with forest islands around them, but every single village has somewhere between four, we found, and 12, that's the, 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 perhaps more, uh, ruined settlement sites, the sites of ruined villages. And it's these sites which um, are highly treasured by farmers for their farming. Um, in Kuranko, they're called Tombondu, uh, land uh, of ruined villages. Um, and people will circulate uh, their farming practices across uh, the landscape in order to target those uh, old former village sites. Not always, but in certain forms of, of, of farming. Uh, in uh, the neighboring region, which again I've studied and talked about at length elsewhere, uh, which are Kisia speakers, uh, people call these ruins or ruined uh, uh, lands, uh, Chepondo, uh, lands uh, of ruined villages, same thing. In fact, they call these sculptures here on the right Pondo as well. You find them sometimes 
on these soils or in these soils when you're farming, and they are a portent of fertility. Pomdo, if you find uh, one of these sculptures, it, it is a, uh, it, a sign of fertility. But, uh, but as, what I'm trying to get at here is that it's not just sort of symbolic in so many ways, that it's found out of a site that is inherently some way fertile. All right, but people don't just uh, work on uh, farm on the ruins of old, old settlements uh, in preference. They also attempt to establish soils that are like those of former settlements. Okay, um, so you try to mimic uh, that, and, and there are ways of uh, cultivating uh, through gardening, uh, through incorporating uh, organic matter, through charring materials that people use to establish soils that are like the soils of ruins. But the soils of ruins are the metaphorical focus of an understanding of fertility. So in order for these other soils to become good, they become like tombondu, adike tombonduri, they, they become this exact translation. So the, the, the ruin becomes the, the conceptual uh, issue for understanding fertility itself. Um, equally, people will say that we in our farming are like termites. Termites have this, this sense of creating villages, termite mounds, uh, and they establish uh, fertility uh, by drawing fertility to a point, a settlement, a location. Uh, again, uh, termites have this, uh, this, this, this distribution uh, across the landscape, a little bit like human villages. And uh, it, it's not just termites as well. Um, this is my slide. Uh, I'm not very good at slides. But this one here e enables you to imagine something. Imagine Gina, their spirits. Um, but they live in villages too. And uh, they, they, the, the villages they have have forests. And as a result of that, they, they are fertile. So all, of, all parts of the landscape here we're talking about are are uh, there because of uh, the fertility is there through settlement, through the settlement of people, through mimicking people, through termites, through jina. Fertility is kind of accumulated. Right, now, uh, it's not just, just that. There's a kind of categorical change around these soils. Um, I wonder if I can, uh, can indicate uh, this. So, uh, the, the, these soils, uh, in order to, to establish them, you, you need to uh, open the land up and, and render the soils oily. Oiliness is uh, something at uh, Itulu. They, they become oily. Uh, and as a result of being, becoming oily, uh, they become uh, initiated into a very different status to the original soil. Now, this kind of mimics uh, female initiation in the region where you cover yourself in oil in order, well you don't in fact you cover your daughters in oil prior to the excision ceremonies but, uh, but where uh, for, to become fertile is, is imaged as to become oily. Um, now oil can come through the sort of practices of gardening in soils you, you, you garden you, you, you work in humic uh, materials you work in uh, biochar or, or whatever but, but oil also comes from the kind of sweat that you, you leave in the soil following your, your, your work. It comes from the blood as you cut yourself as you're working. It comes from defecation. It, it comes from sort of the human uh, life that, that, uh, that, that is generating these soil types, that is generating a sort of fertility. So what I'm trying to get at here is that land becomes almost initiated into fertility. Um, uh, it's, it's, it also, in that very aspect, becomes distinct tenurially. Uh, what uh, people inherit control of uh, these lands um, uh, from generation to another, uh, whether because they lived in them or because they created the soils like them. But so, what I'm trying to get at is that there is a there is a language, certainly in this region, of generating anthropogenic soils that are durably transformed. Now, in, in most of uh, literatures on African soil fertility, there, you don't get the sense of durable transformation. You do get the sense of people, as it were, boosting fertility of soils and then using it all up, and then boosting it and using it all up. 
But what you don't get is a, a, a kind of an appreciation of a categorical distinction which is occurring through this um, uh, within this system, certainly from, from a, a local point of view, and would seem to be uh, there within the Amazonian dark earth literature. Um, yeah, sometimes these durable transformations are, uh, take, take on other words. The, the work of Jan Brewers in Benner uh, speaks of soils being woken up uh, or switched on. Um, well, in this kind of anthropology of silence, uh, why aren't these soils appreciated more? Well, it, it's an enigmatic question. Certainly within the West African world, uh, it, it's very hard to find any literature on appreciation of um, uh, ruins in farming. And yet, within this set of cases where I've been working, it, it is kind of generic, germane to farming. In fact, it's, it's the central metaphor for, for fertility. Um, well, one of the reasons, I think, is that uh, these soils are just being misrecognized. So, for example, in understanding original fertility in Benin, some authors have gone to these kinds of, uh, of soils and imagined them to be the original soils, and therefore that everything else around them is some depleted, lesser soil. So um, if you've got that vision that there is a kind of an original soil, then uh, you go to the best soil, and the best soils are these soils. So, uh, so w once you've taken that decision, you're on a hiding for nothing. Um, uh, so here's, a, here's, here's the, uh, the set of questions. Why is it um, that this question hasn't been asked before in dark earth analysis? Well, I think, obviously, there's this glaring silence from Africa about the existence and significance of dark earths, of anthropogenic soils, uh, of dura durably transformed uh, soils. Um, but also, I think, within the Amazonian literature, there is a sense of there being Amazonian exceptionalism. That is, uh, that there are conditions in the history and uh, an economy of pre-Columbian Amazonia that render uh, that region uh, being a place where ki these kinds of soils might be created, whereas in Africa uh, uh, they wouldn't be. Uh, there are a couple of arguments there. Um, I've got them here. The first is that uh, the Iron Age in uh, Africa is much, uh, much earlier, uh, two and a half thousand years ago, whereas uh, the Iron Age doesn't happen in, uh, well, until, until post-Columbus, more or less, um, in, in uh, Amazonia. So that means that the kind of shifting cultivation uh, that is germane to um, uh, African agricultural practices couldn't have, uh, couldn't have been practiced in Amazonia, and so there are some deductions about that. The trouble is, with those arguments, is that even if there is shifting cultivation in the African continent, there is also an awful lot of cultivation which is more intensive alongside it. There's never just one kind of system. There are many systems, and uh, in our work we track the, the balance between sort of extensive shifting cultivation and more intensive practices. Um, which would have led to these kinds of uh, anthropogenic soils and, and their appreciation. Secondly, actually, there is this distinction about domestic animals, which are uh, less, uh, less used uh, in pre-Columbian farming, if used at all. Um, fish uh, are sort of Amazon and, 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 and domestic animals kind of Africa. But you know, uh, fishing is, is a key element of the economy of most uh, Western Central African forest uh, uh, worlds. So I, I think that, again, one can overstress these distinctions. One can create categorical distinctions between Amazon and Africa, which, which aren't necessarily needed. Um, so what I want to, uh, uh, to do, this is a slide that shouldn't be there. Um, what I, well, it could be there. It is there. So there we go. <laughs> uh, uh, what I want to do, basically, is to sum up and say that, uh, that I think there is plenty of uh, opportunity for um, uh, helping conversations across the uh, certainly Amazon uh, African divide that, that this conference might provide a, a vehicle for and I'm most welcome. Uh, and presumably then, uh, were that to be the case, then other regions of the world might well be profiting from and being inspired by this work that's currently going on uh, in Amazonia and uh, there could be a profit very profitable interaction between these uh, research communities. Thank you.
questions? I can't see a thing. If you're if you're if you raised your hand, I have absolutely no idea. I can't see you. Any any of our Amazonian uh, Black Earth specialists? Uh, here we go. I'm not a specialist in Clark Erickson, um, University of Pennsylvania. But one of the interesting things about the Amazonian Dark Earth is that um, when it was sort of first discovered quite a while back, but it was sort of um, ignored was the fact that it is sort of special, and this exceptionalism, I think, is an important point that you make. Um, the black earths have been found, or at least claimed, for lots of northern Europe, um, probably uh, systems of manuring and things like this, and up through Denmark. But um, as an archaeologist, all, all societies generate garbage, uh, organic garbage, and we're just messy as a species. And we have all kinds of pat cultural patterns about disposal that accumulates it and isolates it and things like that. And the, the interesting thing is then why don't all societies have dark earths? And I think that exceptionalism is important because there's something about what Amazonian peoples and maybe these other peoples where it's showing up are doing very consciously over long, long periods of time to improve the soil. And you know, all, all farmers probably in some sense improve soils, and a lot's been written about this as land desk capital or landscape capital and passing down generation to generation these improvements. Um, but there's something you know, incredibly special about these Amazonian uh, cases. And like you say, until we really understand their formation, and you know, a lot of this has been from the scientific approaches, lab, bench science, and things to try to understand it. But the archaeological um, contribution is great, I think, you know, about how these things form over maybe hundreds, if not thousands, of years. Hmm. Well, I. Uh, what, what I'm asking here is that uh, a, a conversation be established across uh, the, the continents because whilst Amazonian dark earths appear to have a, a very particular set of qualities, uh, th that those qualities could only be established within those conditions uh, is, I think, um, is a, a little bit... Uh, problematic. Uh, yes, societies across the world create garbage and humic uh, soils, and I think I think in many ways uh, that goes unrecognised in the African continent. You know, let alone uh, the potential significance of uh, fundamentally transformed soils of the genre that Amazonian dark earths seem to be. But I think even uh, from the, the ethnographic work that I've encountered uh, in, in, in uh, Guinea, the sense in which uh, ruined villages become the, the focal point of a comprehension of fertility seems to indicate to me uh, of, uh, uh, an, uh, an understanding of uh, transformed fertility which might well echo or mimic uh, the kind of um, uh, distinctions that are made around dark earths in, in Amazonia. I think I, I can see the, the Amazonian is gathering, uh, but please remember to identify yourselves, okay, when you're uh, asking your question. Uh, Susanna Hecht from UCLA. I have a couple of uh, questions. One is I'd like you to talk a little bit more about the tenurial regimes associated with these dark earths because at least among the Kayapo, these are very gendered uh, tenure relations because of the role of women in agriculture. The second thing is since we um, have, everyone admires your papers on discourse, I'm very curious about what you say because of the uh, difference, the time differences about questions of fire and the colonial regimes that looked at fire in, uh, in Africa as compared to Amazonia what you might think about in terms of the question of, well, I've already said it today, pyromania, uh, the pyromania of the, you know, wild man, if you will, and that as a degradation discourse as opposed to the sort of change that this Amazonian black earth supply. Oh, those are two very interesting questions. Yes, I, I didn't stress the gendered nature of the, the, the tenure around these soils. Now, there, there, there are two, in a way, two answers to that. The, the, the ruined villages tend to be associated with particular families, and they tend, tend to be down the sort of patrilineal 
line. Whereas the transformation of soils uh, through gardening uh, purposefully, uh, which mimic ruined soils, uh, is uh, linked to uh, very much women's work. It's gardening, and the, the kind of gardening that, uh, that, that in creates these oily soils creates the tenure for women to go back to. And, but the, whilst it's, it's, it's theirs, the, the, the debates about who should look after it next year, the year after, and down the line are, are more debates. There's no sort of strict um, uh, tenurial inheritance pattern around them. But what there is in a, is in a, a sense that that conversation can be had and must be had with those who've made those investments in, in the soil. Um, on, the, on the second side, on the fire, yeah, well, obviously, you see, <laughs> I've sort of not been talking about the ways in which um, uh, representations of fire in this region uh, have been very aggressively against uh, the, the local use of, of burning in creating productive soils. Now, obviously, fire suppression was fire suppression in relation to shifting cultivation and the, the, the damage that 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 uh, was understood to do during the colonial periods. Um, but th this kind of research would reveal yet another dimension to the logic of burning, uh, which has been well, potentially hitherto unappreciated. Um, now, I'm working in a forest savanna transition zone where fire is, a, is, a, is, a, is part of everyday uh, worlds. The further south in the forest zone, fire is is, is harder to, to make, uh, but it's still made, and, and, and again, still heavily regulated. That such was the, the difficulty of setting fire. I think I've said this elsewhere in, in the 1970s, that actually setting fire in farming fields carried the death penalty in Guinea. So you get the kind of suppression of this uh, system. Um, uh, it it was, still wasn't uh, seen through. Question, but I just want to come to the aid <laughs> of James. Um, I'm Emmanuel Craig uh, at Princeton University. Um, I'm not going to talk about it in my, my 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 paper here because it's about another to topic. But I'm I'm working on a on a study on Southern Africa and there these these this conceptualization of Amazonian black soils is and, and the Terra Mulata, which is even more interesting, of course, is, is very highly uh, uh, relevant. Um, people in Southern Africa uh, see it as, as uh, in terms of environmental infrastructure almost. Uh, mm. Not really culture, but not really nature either. And their, the role of, of, of the, the agency in, because we talk about anthropogenic soils, but it's really, uh, because it's not all conscious so it's it's more than just anthropogenic soil. I think it it, 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 it pulls it into sort of the nature culture dichotomy. I think it's a little bit more than than that. It's a very uh, important concept, though of course in the south because everything is seen as nature and wilderness and dense can be. So I I, I think it's a very um, important concept that really can can uh, mm -hmm. illuminate. Um, um, you know, an alternative view that, that moves us away from this sort of nature, dichot uh, nature culture dichotomy which still uh, 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 pervades, you mm. know, environmental, uh, how, we, how we look at environmental change. So I think it's a very important uh, concept. Thank you. Thank you. I'll take that as a, a comment. Okay. I think we have two questions and I think those will be our final two questions. Um, Mike Heckenberger, University of Florida. Um, I, I work in the Amazon and sometimes I'm amazed at how the soils are classified given the fact most of them are done without soil sampling. Um, and the number of archaeological sites that have actually been well sampled and analyzed is so small, um, I've kind of come to the conclusion that perhaps the variability within Amazonia is as much as the variability with other regions. And even in the small area that I work, there's so much variation. And one thing that has emerged and I was wondering if you could comment from the Amazonian, or excuse me, the African side, but one thing that's emerged recently as, for instance, corporations are actually seeking patents on terra preta formation is since these are variable and they're connected to very specific forms 
of cultural knowledge, which means intellectual property rights and ownership, um, how are indigenous, in your case, in, in many of the Amazonian cases, the, the direct connections between living Amazonian peoples and the archaeological sediments are not clear. In the Kayapo case and the Shingu case where we work, it is, and it's a very, very critical issue. But the cases that you, that you presented uh, where people are living right on these sites, how are indigenous voices being incorporated into the Terra Preta dialogue as it emerges? Well, I think the short answer to that is that it hasn't emerged yet. Um, I mean, the, the appreciation of uh, these kinds of soils is prompted by the kind of work and discussions that have been had by, by yourselves and in the Amazonian uh, research community. The, 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 transfer, the, the, the very concept that there could be something to patent, <laughs> uh, a knowledge there that is, that is, um, that is uh, amenable to, to uh, well, yeah, to, to corporate investment. Um, it, it just hasn't uh, emerged. It might now the, the new laws around indigenous uh, property rights have become much more stringent. Um, so, uh, in, you know, for primary, for secondary literature. So, I think that um, the, 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 you know, down the line the dilemmas uh, might well emerge of the sort that must be there within your own research sites and exactly the same as our own. Um, I think one of the, th the most interesting things about the African soil uh, transforming world is that it is there, uh, sort of on location. You, you can explore it as, a, you know, as, as what farmers are, uh, are up to. Um, so it, it, if the soils are uh, analogous the same, <laughs> um, then uh, the kind of research on how they're formed in the African conditions is going to be very interesting for those seeking to understand how they're formed uh, in different parts of the Amazon. So, um, you know, a lot depends upon there being much more and better research on these kinds of soils in the African continent, which is what I'm uh, really uh, seeking to develop. Monica Yanofsky, University of Sussex. Thanks, you, James. Um, I just wanted to say something about um, the field site. Uh, we're a project which I'll say something more about tomorrow is because I'm not going to be talking about soils. Um, this is in the centre of Borneo, where there's a tableland area uh, which uh, involves where there is both sweetened cultivation and um, wet rice cultivation. And um, I think there's the possibility that you might find this kind of soil generation there. There are areas which are called locally patar, which are um, considered very fertile and very desirable, and people return to them regularly. And uh, it's not really clear at the moment whether these are used, uh, these were used in the past uh, for uh, forms of dry shifting cultivation, wet shifting cultivation, or wet cultivation, quite what people were doing there. But um, I think that the, you know, investigation of the soils there might might um, be worthwhile. Um, the project, the cultured rainforest that I'm working on, um, ha involves archaeology and environmental science, and um, this project or possibly subsequent projects might might have the possibility of doing that. So, just say there may be some parallels in that part of the world too. Um, and I thought that it was very interesting um, what you were saying about the um, generation of fertility. There's some interesting. Um, con there's a contrast possibly um, as well as perhaps parallels in um, Southeast Asia. I mean, uh, what I w have found in, uh, in this area in central Borneo is um, that people talk, the discourse of fert around fertility is related to bringing in wild fertility from the forest, but um, it's also very important what people do to the soil and leaving a mark on the soil, and I'll say something about this tomorrow in terms of other types of marks, but um, agricultural um, marks in terms of changing the soil c could well be uh, relevant here, although I've looked at it more in terms of moving earth and not changing the earth. So um, I don't know whether you want to take this as a comment or a question, but I, I, I'd say I think it, it would be worth looking in Southeast Asia too, as well as Africa. <laughs> Thank you. I think the, I take it as an ori origin of a conversation. <laughs> well, Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you.